Hi there. Today I'm back in Jing Mai for a couple of days because it's the, the holiday, you know, like the Dragon Boat Festival, Duan Wu Jie. Um, yeah, so we're back in Jing Mai for a couple of days and then we'll uh, have a look at the Shupuer in Monghai area in Xishuang Bana. Actually, Jing Mai is very close to Monghai area and I was thinking like, uh, should we consider like Jing Mai Monghai area because of its geographic proximity? Or should we only stick to the taste to define those uh, those areas? Um, but that's what we're going to discuss in this video. And to keep me um, well, to keep me well watered during this video, I have some tea from Ibang um, that I received from a, a fellow tea producer. So Ibang is located in the center east of Xishuangbanna. Uh, it's east of Jinghong and west of Yiwu. It's in the six famous tea mountains. And that place is famous for having a pure um, small leaf varietal. So as I understand, it is Camellia sinensis var sinensis and not var samica. Although I'm not a hundred percent sure about it. Because we could also imagine to have a var samica which has very small leaves. But in this case, I, I think it's really the the varsinensis that we're talking about and um, i've only been there once it was in 2010 and um yeah it's an interesting area nowadays it's mostly rubber tree plantations in the six famous tea mountains actually only iwu has a, a significant amount of tea uh, the other tea mountains they are really just a group of scattered villages with um, very very sparsely uh, populated in terms of tea trees and uh, tea producers. Uh, last time I went there it was mostly rubber tree plantations. But uh, I hope if we travel there we can find good stuff. Especially in Ibang, I'm, uh, I still uh, kind of like that area. We just need to find uh, good producers and good examples of these teas. So this session will be an opportunity to try another sample that I haven't tried yet. I got them in poor and yeah i didn't i haven't had time to to try them yet so let's try and in this video i would like to discuss mainly to continue this discussion that we started um in the mong high taste episodes about what's a terroir and so i was having some wine and um i was thinking you have two main kinds of wine you know like you have new world wine and old world wine so basically old world would be European wines and new world will, would be all the, the rest like South America, uh, North America, um, Australia, South Africa, okay, these places. And it's actually very similar to how the, the tea industry developed, right? We could say you have, you have an old world which would be maybe, well, mainly China and probably Japan, Taiwan although these, uh, in these areas tea arrived a bit later. And then you'd have the New World, which would be more like the, the British colony uh, tea, so that would be Sri Lanka, Kenya, um, India, and uh, yeah, Nepal, countries like this. We have quite a similar situation, but I think the marketing in the wine business is more developed than in the tea. And what you can see in the wine business is that uh, in the old world, we talk mostly about the terroir. It means like um, a relatively well-defined producing area. And we talk about the geography, right? You can have some Bordeaux wine, Burgundy wine. Uh, these are um, areas and we separate them according to the villages. But in the new world, the emphasis, the emphasis is put on the varietal use, okay, the, the cultivar use, so it could be Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Noir, um, okay, varietals like that. So that's interesting, I, I would guess that because the industry um, was quite young in the, in the new world, it was more strategic to um, to emphasize on something else than terroir because they couldn't talk about terroir because they had no history. Now what would you say about the, the poor tea industry? Is it a very old industry or actually a new industry? 
I would tend to say that the the approach, the current approach, is only about twenty years old. The idea of uh, really um, separating the mountains and well, trying to apply this kind of uh, terroir um, idea. You can see that in many places, for example, um, in Fujian, like when you're talking about rock teas, you're talking about the varietal first, right? Whether it's a Tieluohan, a Suixian, or other stuff, it's mainly the, the varietal that you name first. Only in the highest quality Oolong teas, you will um, really talk about the terroir. Like, for example, if, you, if you're buying some... Uh, some Wui teas, like from the real uh, Wui mountain, then you will have some specific spots. But this is only a very tiny part of the market, right? But interestingly, um, in the poor tea market at large, we mainly talk about the, the mountain of production and not about the varietal. Now, you could say it's because there is no varietal in, uh, in poor tea. At least uh, there are no varietals that we um, we created on purpose, um, but there is surely a, a wide um, genetic variation depending on the mountain, and you can see that very easily uh, by looking at the leaves. Okay, if you check leaves in Laoman or Guafengzai, well, or in many places in Iwu, you will have very big leaves. And yeah, if you go to if you go to Jingmai or or to Ibang or to I don't know Yoloshan or Mongku, you you will tend to have smaller leaves. Um, and even then, you can still make the difference between big leaves from Lamanha and big leaves from Guafengzai. They just don't really look the same. The the Lamanha leaves have much more hair, um, and yeah, they just look a, a little bit different. And size is only one factor, of course. So we could also argue that um, most of the taste is uh, brought by the varietal. Well, at least it's probably the, the biggest factor that influences the taste. Now other factors would be altitude, agricultural techniques, um, maybe soil composition, okay? Processing, uh, processing techniques, but well, let's not talk about processing. Let's just stay on the raw material first. So you'd say, for example, altitude. Now we say that the varietals they were not uh, created on purpose. Okay, we're still it's all sexual sexual reproduction. So we don't have identical. We don't have clones like it is the case for uh, all oolong teas and in many places in the world. So. The difference between the the varietals is not as clear cut as it would be, for example, for oolong, um, simply because even within different varietals, you might find uh, similar looking leaves just because of randomness. Okay, you have to always um, make an average. But you could still say, since you harvest a lot of tea leaves, actually the um, the average you will get, the difference will be pretty consistent. It should be if you have thousands of leaves, even though there is um, variation within each population, uh, if you take uh, thousands of samples and you, you do the average, you, you will consistently get uh, a marked difference. Now, the thing is, if the varietals were not intentional, they were created through natural selection. For example, I can think of altitude as being a major, um, a major pressure, you could say, a major uh, se selection pressure um, characteristic, like factor. Because the higher you go, uh, the more the tea will be exposed to frost, for example. And it will be less exposed to pest and disease in return. So you will have that, that environment. Um, during frost episodes, um, a lot of the t trees will die. If you, if let's say you bring a varietal from outside, you you plant a thousand of them. Let's say there's a big frost episode, your varietal is not really adapted, and let's say uh, nine hundred uh, of those tea trees will die. 
well now you have you can say you have a different varietal right you kept the 10 percent the 100 trees that were the most resistant to frost okay and um and if you do, so now you're going to take seeds from those 100 uh, trees that are left and you're going to replant your gardens and now you're, you're going to have another frost episode and you will also lose so you will you will have successions of um of natural selection episodes unlike like we unlike what we tend to think like natural selection is not necessarily slow it really depends on the the nature of the of the pressure okay um and for plants which can be replanted in a fairly short short time like you could say the um well you could say for for the tea tree that would be maybe five years you could consider like from the time you can plant a new seed to the time you can really harvest it um, commercially but if we're talking about frost and the plants die early then uh, the selection will be done earlier so you can create a varietal in a few decades actually or even less if you're in in a in a lab you could say like in a more controlled conditions but let's say you're just in a village and you're not intentionally selecting your varietals I would argue it, it would only take um, one or, or two decades to create a new a new varietal a new genetic group from the um, the original from from the original group that you you brought the seeds from so you could imagine that based on on this reasoning each mountain would have um, a specific varietal and I actually read a paper that supports this so they took samples uh, of different ancient tea gardens in different mountains in, in Sichuan Bana and they showed that uh, I think all of the mountains they had uh, a significantly different genetic pool from the other mountains so even if we didn't create those varietals intentionally they are there and these varietals they are constrained by by the geography so in our case actually we we could think that the the geography is intimately linked to the varietal or you could say it uh, the opposite right <laughs> like the the varietal you will get is intimately linked to the the place you are in because of this natural selection and that would be um that would be even more true for ancient tea gardens which have had time to have a natural selection right um, if we talk about all the natural tea gardens no it wouldn't be the case because most of the the tea gardens they were not planted from seeds uh from the ancient tea gardens actually usually you had uh you had a centralized um kind of seedling centers and they would distribute the leaves when when it was in the 90s they wanted to accelerate and somewhat um, standardize the tea production so for example the natural tea gardens in Jingmai most of them they are not from the same uh, they are not from the same varietal as um, the ancient tea gardens some of them are I've heard like the oldest natural tea gardens which are like 50 years old uh, they first used the seeds from the ancient tea gardens and then they got seeds from from the city from poor actually from poor to Lantang and it's hard to retrace where those seeds are uh, were coming from well at least I haven't put the, the research work into retracing this but we could guess that you know the mountain that's over there which also has like plantations it's probably the same varietal as Jingmai okay let me drink my tea hmm. interesting Kogan uh, very fragrant but also quite a good punch quite different from the the Yibang tea that I had uh, last time which was uh, with smaller leaves, leaves and more greenish. This is from Ibang area, but honestly, I, I can't read the two characters he's written on top. 
well the handwriting is uh, not so good I'm sorry to say that but well it's San Sanlin Gusu so it's forest it's supposed to be forest ancient tea trees but I'll ask him about the which village it's com it comes from because Ibang is actually quite a large area and you have um, many villages which are considered Ibang area and you see that's the point like many villages are considered Ibang area just like many vi villages are not considered Bingdao area or Banzong area and well people determine what what's what's the terroir and sometimes so I guess they would be grouped according to geographic proximity and hopefully mm, similarities in taste okay so for example in Banzang as I understand you you can you can say there are three villages you have Lao Banzang you have Xin Banzang and you have Bakanoi but yet there are obviously differences in in those terroir and well Lao Banzang is supposed to be like the best representation of the best example of that Banzang area just like in Bingdao area you have like six six or seven villages and the Bingdao Laozai Bingdao old village is supposed to be well the most prestigious and the best uh, example the best ambassador you can find in that area okay so we have Jingmai mountain on Jingmai mountain you have 10 villages and Jingmai Tajai, the village we're in, is the most famous one, and that's where the the tea is the most expensive. Now you also have Mangjing, uh, which is like the the second, okay, the um, the the second most famous. Well, mainly because it's a big village and it's a different character. Still, yeah, they they are all considered um, Jingmai area. Jingmai area. And this is easy. They just did this uh, limit. They just defined this limit uh, by rivers. You know, we have the Nanlang River over there, down there in the valley, which just shows that that's the limit of Jingmai area. Now, of course, if you're down the river, you have a few tea gardens there. So they are at fairly low altitude. I would say maybe one thousand meter. You know, at the down in the valley. And you would have tea gardens on the other side of that mountain, uh, on the mountain um, opposite ours. So that would be Mangyun, Mangyun Mountain. And you could guess that if you're at the river and you have tea on one side and tea on the other side, uh, they are likely to taste very similar, unless the soil is different. The soil is different, and that can happen, um, that happen quite often at uh, at a river actually because usually the the rivers they like to to dig where it's easier and it's easier usually at um, at an intersection between two types of rocks but I don't think it's the case here in Jingmai usually the the soil is quite similar in all that area so my point is um, sometimes we have to to define hard boundaries for the terroir like if you go to France you go to Burgundy they have very detailed maps of each village and what's the classification of each village they have some government control labels uh, which will kind of uh, well which will label what kind of grade that that wine is based on the geography okay and of course these hard boundaries are always um, always bring in a kind of unfairness because you could be just beyond the boundary and not belong to that terroir and still have a very similar taste and again you could argue that uh, the one that's in the terroir at the boundary it probably doesn't have the same taste at, as the one that's in the center of that terroir okay so a terroir should be uh, a range of tastes which is coherent, which still has a, a distinct personality. I think the where the unfairness is, the bias is, is that, well, as humans, we have to set some hard boundaries on the map, um, but nature is not as simple, and maybe 
even depending on the years or depending on the the agricultural techniques maybe the terroir would be revealed or not for example well i'd say one of the characteristics of good jing mai tea uh, a very noticeable characteristic would be the orchid fragrance and this i would say it's very characteristic of tapping zhang now why is it so? Is it because of the heavy shading in Taping Zhang? Or is it because of the very sandy soil we have in Taping Zhang? Is it for some slope reasons? Like there's a lot of organic matter mainly because um, it's a relatively flat area and so organic matter um, doesn't really flows down like it is the case on the slopes. Is it a matter of uh, varietal? Maybe the varietal in Tapingjiang is slightly different from the varietal on the slopes. And that could make sense if you study agricultural history. Um, I don't know about this and I think it would be hard to know now, but the ancient tea gardens probably started from somewhere. Mm. And maybe it would be, it started from the plateau, so that maybe that's the oldest trees. Or maybe it's not. I said there is a microclimate in uh, Tapingjiang. It's uh, well, you yeah, you could say it's much colder on the plateau than on the slopes. Maybe because of that. Mm, uh, like I said at the beginning of this video, maybe because of that factor, because of the microclimate, a specific varietal mm, was created in that area, and that one only brings. Uh, the orchid fragrance so it's really hard to to point to point at one factor that would give you the the typicity of the terroir and now i've drunk uh, teas from other areas which also feature this uh, very characteristic orchid fragrance and which could be mistaken for jingmai tea and it can be um, places which are geo geographically very far away from uh, Jingmai Mountain. But maybe the conditions of their tea gardens, like for example the shading, the, the degree of slopes, or maybe by, by pure uh, coincidence the, the genetic, the, the varietal that you can find there, uh, maybe is similar to the one you can find in Jingmai. And that would explain the similarities. So I would say it could be a mistake actually to to think that um, geographically close uh, terroirs or areas produce similar tastes. That's what we try to put in our brain like when we talk about Monghai tea, the Monghai taste, so you have lots of tea mountains close to Monghai, so that's one kind of taste. And then you have lots of tea mountains in Mongku, and since they are far away from Monghai, they must be very different. But what if, by, the, by, the, by coincidence, by the randomness of the landscape, you would find uh, very similar features between, I don't know, let's say, um, Nanno Shan, in Monghai area and uh, and Xiao Husai or, or uh, I don't know or you know Baka or some other villages in Mongku area um, that that would be possible maybe the, the two mountains would be at similar altitudes and they would have uh, similar um, varietals Maybe because of history, maybe some people migrated there and brought the seeds. Maybe because of um, a coincidence in, uh, in genetic uh, deviation, in genetic evolution. And by, by sheer coincidence, you would have rather similar varietals, even though they are not related. And you can find these examples a lot. Uh, if you look at the animal world, like you have uh, species... Mm, that look very similar but are totally un unrelated. For example, uh, you know, like some species that that you find only in the Americas and some that you'd find only in Europe, which look quite the same but are totally different. They just 
uh, it's called uh, evolution convergence, I think, mm, because of similar environments. Actually, they got the the same uh, the same selection pressure, and so they they look quite the same. This could happen in the T in the T world, especially as I as I said re related to altitude, and also related if you're uh, at low altitude, for example, related to pest and disease pressure. Well, based on that logic, we could think that okay, so same uh, a similar altitude would lead to a similar taste, but that's definitely not true. I would say that's not true because, um, yeah, well, like Jingmai has the same altitude as uh, as Naka, for example. Okay, but um, the taste is very different. Now you would say yes, yeah, so it's um, it's a combination of the varietal, the environment, then the, the agricultural techniques, the culture, etc. And that's that aspect, that combination, that makes the, the thinking incredibly complex, okay? Because you can never re really isolate one factor, okay? Because let's say the altitude mm, brings a certain taste, but the thing is, the altitude also uh, brings a certain varietal, as I said, like you have uh, connections between the evolution and the altitude. But maybe there are, there are other factors beyond the altitude, like you could be at 1,500 meters at the top of a mountain, of a small mountain, or you could be at 1,500 meters on the slope of a big mountain, and it will probably... Um, lead to a, a different microclimate maybe a different ecosystem different species that you will find different um different shining uh, along the um, like for example tapping zhong is quite uh, is uh, quite particular quite unique because it's at, at the top of a mountain okay so you're at 1650 something and that's a plateau and you rarely find that organization most of the time the ancient tea gardens are on the slope okay you also have like the agricultural practices and the agricultural agricultural practices it can be shading this is totally determined by the um, by the farmers so yeah I, I would guess that it makes a major difference whether there, there is shade or not. Uh, shade, I made a video about the importance of shade trees. Of course, you you change the degree of, uh, uh, you, you change the light that goes in the gardens, but you change much more than this. You It will affect the soil, the soil quality, the, the organic matter content. It will affect the ecosystem, okay? The biodiversity you will find. Um, so let's imagine also that some things that will affect the varietal, the evolution, if in the long term, if let's say your trees are shaded and maybe you have more insects in them, so you will have a, a larger variety of insects due to the, uh, the shade and um, like, like the partial shade, which will, will allow uh, both like species who, who like light and species who like uh, shade to coexist and will also attract predators then you will have more uh, more stuff eating the tea and that will probably influence like what's best in terms of evolution for the tea so maybe same altitude but whether the the tea tree the trees are shaded or not you will have also a different uh, selection pressure and a different evolution in the varietal it adds an another layer of complexity because you could see gardens that uh, nowadays are not shaded they decided to cut the forest but which evolved for hundreds of years in the forest you know and uh, maybe because of that um, that past they will have a, a different um, a different genetic so you see if we're trying to think in a well you could say in a materialistic way and and trying to think 
from uh, like a, bunt, a bottom up approach I mean starting from the soil and from the varietals and the characteristics and assuming that if we have the same uh, conditions like same varietal same environment then we will get the same taste and that's really a big assumption I can tell you because it um, it implies that we really understand everything that's going on and this we don't really honestly uh, we don't really understand the things about the soil composition related to the taste you know people like to say yeah it depends on the soil and everything and it's it's quite a mystery because the soil interactions are very complex and I don't have any data really on uh, you know the relationship between let's say you have a lot of zinc in your soil well what is what is it gonna bring in terms of taste honestly I don't know so that idea of uh, going from the um, starting from the soil and the varietal and trying to define a theoretical taste um, well we could try it but um, I wish you good luck because I think some researchers are taking that approach and I hope they can find results because the good thing is if you if you can make a, a working model on this it means that you can go to an area where there's no tea and you could kind of predict whether that area would bring good tea or not and that would be a major advantage because you know maybe there are dozens of places which would get uh, which would give you Lao Banzang quality tea but there's no tea on it because uh, well historically people just never planted tea there or maybe there are areas like this and they are not known and maybe the the tea gardens are managed intensively so that richness that potential is not exploited okay but that approach I think would be uh, very hard to achieve so another approach is to, to um, start from the taste and uh, then look at the environment and try to find some correlations between many elements mm. and the difficulty in there I think lies first in having a, a standard idea of the taste you know and I feel like I even see it from all the feedbacks and discussions that I have with the customers and with uh, fellow tea drinkers and tea professionals and I find that we often have we can have very different ideas very different feelings about uh, a given tea so I find that yeah there, there are limits to the human nose really and our palate you know so to the point that maybe tea tasting is more of an art more about subjectivity and kind of like sublimating transcending our uh, subjectivity uh, having yourself in a great mood thanks to your tea than it is about objectively identifying the characteristic of a tea um, yeah honestly as humans we were pretty bad tasters we can't really identify tastes as reliably as we can for colors for example okay like most people would agree that uh, two colors are, are different and one is darker than the other but uh, in terms of taste like um, yeah in terms of taste especially when you get into aroma Mm, it gets very subjective now there is a solution to this a friend of mine at the tea research institute in Puer <laughs> they are uh, setting up a, an electric nose electronic nose so you just give the the machine tea and it will yeah it will tell you I think about the polyphenol content and things like that so that would be taking that approach like a purely materialistic approach objective approach you you consider that teas are similar because they have similar compounds in them and you start from there and then you you try to um, find correlations between yeah let's say uh, the amount of polyphenols and the altitude or the shading or things like this so in my opinion that would be maybe the um, the easiest approach to take in terms of uh, looking for uh, a scientific truth okay building um, evidence of correlations and stuff but the problem is I was discussing that with her and 
and we ended up uh, thinking like what does what does it have to do with people's enjoyment of tea really because um i don't think it's really possible to measure the goodness of uh, of a good laomana tea of good lao banjang of good bingdao jingmai and that's the thing that gets me thinking like maybe it's not only materialistic maybe there's something that is immaterial about the tea there's something that's subjective that can be created but by culture but not only because i found out that um, some people who are not acquainted at all with the poor tea culture can also enjoy a poor tea and maybe they will give you um totally different reasons for why they enjoy this tea than the ones you have in mind um but i think that that's that's really why we like poor tea i think um, i really love science but i kind of like poor tea because i can feel that we'll never be able to really explain it scientifically and to understand it and that's why i keep drinking it and you could also think that if it was possible to explain it maybe we would have already done that but on the other hand you could say that the poor tea culture is only 20 years old and i hope we will um try new new ways of uh, thinking about the terroir and how we should organize uh, all the, the different poor teas. But meanwhile, it's just very interesting, I think, to just compare these teas. So we try to give you as much information as possible, objective information like the altitude, where the tea comes from, um, things like that. Huh? And in the end, I think these, these objective informations are more helpful to you than the subjective information like what the tea tastes like. Because I think what the tea tastes like, you'll be able uh, to, to, well, you will be able to, to get your own experience from this. Now, where the tea comes from or the altitude, this, you, you need to have the information. Uh, and the information is objective, so there's no real need for discussion about this. So I prefer to focus on the objective informations. Mm. Yeah, I give the subjective information like the taste, I think as a, as a guideline, because still, even though there's variation, I know that um, there are different broad, I think, broad kinds of qualities that you can, we can agree on. And these, uh, well, maybe it can help you buy the tea. But anyway, I think it's still a problem, you know, for me to define uh, the terroir and how to sort those teas. So yeah, we now I'm, I'm kind of following the mainstream approach, which is uh, dividing by mountain and then by villages. And when I try, I can also uh, I try to get as much info on the on the gardens themselves in the village. But I'm curious, uh, maybe you have other ideas as to um, like how to better um, better divide and identify those teas okay so yeah that's about it i'm gonna keep drinking my tea because honestly i haven't paid much much attention but it uh, it tastes interesting i'm gonna leave you here and i'll see you later um, for more thoughts about this meanwhile i'd be very interested in having your opinions about the topic of terroir and how we should sort the different teas uh, in the comment section okay so thank you for watching and see you later bye bye